All righty. Welcome back, everybody, to On The Fly Podcast. Uh, we have a super, super duper special guest tonight. Uh, my mentor, Apple mentor, amazing mentor, Philip Steele. Um, Philip, so I know you. I've known you for almost about two years now. Two years now, which is crazy. And almost a year ago, when I visited you, uh, you know, in, in your homeland in California, that was fun. Got to meet your family. Got to hang out. Maybe we'll get to that in a bit. But um, as for as for our guests, um, our, our our listeners, and as for Zach as well, can you kind of give a little bit of a elevator pitch of who you are, what you do, what you're all about? Who is Philip Steele? Sure. Well. I'd say the single word to describe me, I, I guess, at this stage in, in my life is I'm an engineer. <laughs> Obviously, uh, I graduated from the University of Akron in 2013, and then I started my career at General Motors. I was there for eight years. During that time, I also pursued a master's degree in systems engineering. So I uh, obtained that from Purdue University. And two years ago, I started interviewing. Well, actually, three years ago, I started interviewing, and I accepted an a job offer at Apple. So I've been there for the last two years and just thoroughly enjoying life. Uh, outside of work, I have a family, I have a three-year-old son, and I enjoy constantly learning and you know, I, I kind of set goals and continuously chase them. So I'm trying to be as productive as I can, contribute somewhat back to society uh, outside of just, you know, the economy, <laughs> I guess you could say. And uh, that's me in a nutshell. No, Any I other details, it. feel free to ask. Oh, 100%, 100%. And, you know, I can definitely attest to that because Phil, again, he's my mentor. So when he says, you know, giving back, he definitely means that. Again, I've known Phil for over two years now, and we tend to at least have one conversation at least once a month, if not, I think in the past. When we had some more time, we were a little more flexible, even bi-weekly, if not weekly. But I know because we're super busy and, you know, time's a little bit um, pinched. But nonetheless, I love Phil because Phil's able to take time out of his busy day to pour into me, to give me insight, because as you know, Zach knows, and perhaps some of our listeners, I I could see myself at Apple in the future, right? So that's that's essentially why um, I reached out to Phil what two years ago now. Uh, Phil, obviously you know the story, but I can you know let our listeners know, let Zach know, is um you know I was looking for my first co-op, and uh, I was I had my top three companies, be it what Apple, Medtronic, and Boston Scientific, right? Being a biomedical engineer, I could see myself, you know, utilizing my skills at Apple, perhaps on the Apple Watch. So I thought, you know, at Apple. And I was like, you know, with my kind of knowledge and networking skills, I really want to leverage my LinkedIn and maybe try to see if I can find people who are alumni um, that work at the company of choice, you know, be it Apple. And it was very interesting before I even started doing that. I know, you know, Ms. Crest or uh, Phil knows Ms. Cressman very well. And I don't know exactly if you know Ms. Crescent, but amazing um, person on this campus. I think she's just, she's done so many wonders for so many students like me. But she recommended, she's like, Yinka, I know one Apple alumni, or one University of African alumni who works at Apple, and he would be amazing for you to connect with. And I was like, Ms. Crescent, put me on, put me on, right? Uh, she gave me, you know, your LinkedIn. I reached out to you and be the, me being the type of guy who will, you know, shoot shot in the dark, you know, just to try and see what happens because, you, you know, you never know what happens. I remember, you know, shooting you a LinkedIn message. I was kind of telling you who I am and, you know, why I'm reaching out to you. And I also aspire, you know, again, to work at this company, but, you know, even connecting with a person who looks like me, you know what I'm saying? Like that, that hits, hits home, right? And out of the kindness of your heart, you responded and you're like, yeah, like, let's do this. hundred percent, let's do this. And I, from there on, I was like, okay, this guy's awesome. The first conversation was fire. You know, I, I think we did even like our I get to know you, you know, a mentor mentee paper, which was super cool. And I, I implemented that for Zach, Sean and I. And, you know, I just I was like, Phil is an honest soul. who's just trying to help and trying to give back because he saw when he was in this program, be it, you know, ideas. Right. Which is uh, increasing diversity, in engineering, academics, how much of an impact that had on him, how much Chris, Ms. Cressman had an impact on him. He's like, I want to pay it forward. And even I can see myself, Yinka, I can see myself doing that in the future, right? Nonetheless, as I digress, you know, Phil, I, again, I appreciate you for being on this episode tonight. I know we're going to dive super deep into some awesome details on, you know, your, your past, perhaps some future plans. Obviously, we're a finance podcast, so we're going to ask questions about that. And then I'm going to be reminiscing on some awesome stories that you and I and some conversations you and I have had in the past. But nonetheless, um, you know, kind of one of the first things I would like to tap into is, you know, back when you were in school. Back when you were a student here on campus as a double E, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, right. So what were some of the things that you saw as challenges 
and then how you overcame them. And then perhaps, I know this is kind of a loaded question, but then also as well, like, cause I know you and I've had some conversations about this. You always were the type, since you're an engineer as well, you're very analytically minded. You always were thinking long-term future, right? So maybe what kinds of things did you put in place as a college student? Because a lot of our, our audience are college students. What kind of things did you put in place? Maybe what did you implement? What did you sacrifice monetarily, discipline, what have you? What set Phil apart from all the other students when he was a college student? That is a great question. So I'll, I'll start from the, the first question that you asked was, it, what are the challenges? And for me personally, uh, it was almost strictly coursework related, especially as you get to the junior, senior year, uh, things ramp up, especially in EE. Uh, and so it's kind of difficult to understand whether or not trudging through the coursework and really pushing your GPA to the max of your ability is, is it worthwhile in the long run? I think with engineering, at least, you have to sacrifice time. So that, that could be sleep, it could be your social life. One of those, uh, it's, it's the workload is just tremendously high. And so the question I have for myself is, what is the industry like? Is it, is it like this all the time? Am I going to be challenged like, you know, controls one exam every, you know, every day? Um, and co-op was one of the key things that allowed you know, me and you both to experience what industry is like, how it differs. And so uh, <clears throat> once I had that taste, it gave me a sense that, you know, maybe the work that we do in undergrad it isn't necessarily, necessarily applicable everywhere. And that actually honestly kept me motivated. So that's that's challenge number one was just the, the raw effort that you have to put in to succeed. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, and second was um, just, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it a challenge, but one of the things that I learned was developing relationships between people. Networking, communication, soft skills are absolutely critical. And that's the differentiator between, you know, what I would call, say, your average engineer and, and those folks that, that in, end up going to, you know, develop their own thing or, or move up in companies. You have to have those soft skills. And they, they really don't push that too much. So ultimately, I'd say it's a balance, being well balanced, um, having technical aptitude and also the ability to uh, communicate very well. Those are separators, especially in our field. <clears throat> That's awesome, Phil. Like everything in life, there's a, a good balance there for sure. Um, Can you hear a little bit about your, uh, your college career uh, and what the building blocks were to get you to where you were today? You mentioned you went from GM to Apple. Um, were you doing something Correct. somehow similar in the automotive industry to uh, electronics, or was this a total leap of faith? I don't like what I'm doing. I want to try this. So it was not a, it really wasn't a choice. So just to give you a background, my, <laughs> I'm a fan of Apple. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the company. Um, there's, I don't know if there's anyone there that remembers, but I came into the ideas program as the only person with a Mac. This was in 2008, so I ended up graduating in 2013. And when I left, I had converted everyone. So it, the, the, the quick backstory behind it is that I used to be a PC guy. I used to hate Apple, and then they kind of slowly won my heart over with iPod and iPhone. Once I switched to Mac, which is the crazy story behind that, but I don't think we have time to get into the details. Um, <clears throat> when that happened, I was sold, and I just slowly became more and more a fan of the company. So, But to answer your original question, um, I can't speak to you about precisely what I do now, but the company did reach out to me for a specific skill set that I had. It was a combination of skills that I had from multiple positions at GM. And once I saw that LinkedIn message, I, I thought it was a dream at first, and I like reset my mind the next day. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Let's go forward with this opportunity and uh, began the interview process. And my interview process was actually quite extended. It was, it was pretty unique. Typically, you go through a series of phone interviews they bring you on site. Uh, Silicon Valley interviews are very intense, so it's basically a full day of interviews. But I had three on sites because the the project that I'm a part of now is pivoting, so they didn't really know where I fit. So I, I spent a, a while interviewing. Very cool. Um, but I, I cannot tell you. Yeah, I can't tell you the link between what I did there and what I do now. Unfortunately, gotcha. that's some top secret classified stuff. So uh, a little <laughs> bit of a tangent. I know a lot of our audience, you know, we're, we like to target 
uh, some kids that are our age or maybe a little bit younger, right? Because Yinka, Sean, and I were, you know, at one point, you know, the early college career kids who didn't know anything about finances and, you know, trying to learn a lot. And that's led us to what we're doing now. When you're on that journey as a, as a college kid trying to, you know, find a career, you're going to be interviewing naturally. Did you do anything special to prepare for interviews? Do you have uh, kind of a process? Do you go over flashcards? What process did you did you take to prep yourself for the interview for your dream job? Ah, so the interview here was different than I would say you would experience as an entry level employee. So everyone hired in this group is considered to be an expert in a particular field or skill set. So um, the preparation isn't really, I don't know if it's really actually possible. Uh, it's really <laughs> yeah. them trying to seek and find what your current knowledge base is. So I did do, I did prep, but in hindsight, I didn't actually need to. So it was completely different than, than what you would think, particularly for an entry level interview. Um, so just to give you some background, when I interviewed for my co-op and I interviewed for a full-time offer at GM, I did, uh, you know, I studied the things that I was, you know, learning in undergrad, and I focused on just simple things like the star format or the bar format, where you you have a question, you explain what the background is, so describe the situation, you tell what your actions are, and then you explain your results. Um, that, for an interview like this, was almost thrown out of the window. There's a lot of technical whiteboarding. They really dig in to see if you if you know what you're applying for. So um, they're selective, but if you have a skill set that fits and you are what they're looking for, I wouldn't say it's terribly difficult. It's just very long and it's it's tiring. It's, it's the kind of interview where you just want to go to sleep after you're done. Because um, for, just to give you an example, my interview was started at 9 a.m. I think it was 30 minutes with the recruiter and then uh, a couple hiring managers and then multiple teammates that I end up actually working with now. But there was no lunch break. <laughs> Um, I ate lunch when I was interviewed, but I was eating lunch, and it ended at five. And uh, they give you two days out here for free, which is nice, but it, it, it's it's quite unique in terms of interviews. But that is standard for Silicon Valley, not just Apple. Just... Wow, no kidding. Yeah, that's intense. Uh, very impressive. So I think your interview process is probably not the most relatable to someone going into uh, you know an entry level <laughs> position. But uh, for anyone listening, uh, Phil mentioned the Star Method, uh, which is a great method to use if you are going into, you know, maybe your first round of interviews or a uh, an entry level position if you're a new college student, even a high school student, you're ever starting an interview, the STAR method, the S is for situation, the T is for task, the A is for action, and the R is for result. And this is a, a, a structure by which you can tell a story or answer an interview question uh, very concisely and to the point, therefore giving yourself a pretty good uh, shot at impressing your interviewer. The situation, the S, is where you want to set your scene and give details of the example you're about to give. The T is the task. That's where you describe what your responsibility was in that situation. A is where you explain exactly what uh, actions you took. A is for action to to achieve uh, that task that you were given in T. And R is the result. So share what outcomes your actions achieved. Uh, you know, what effects you had with your actions. So that's a good little format for anyone who's who's listening to use in their first uh, interviews if you're looking for some preparation. Uh, Phil, so moving on here, you, uh, it seems like you really like your job at Apple. That's phenomenal. Um, so a little more into your personal life. Do you do anything uh, financially in the theme of On The Fly, Financial Literacy Institute? How do you handle your budget? Do you do something special? Do you just, you know, make sure your credit card bill at the end of the month isn't too much? Do you track it really, really closely? What does Phil do? Absolutely. So um, the, the beautiful thing about this entire pod is that you guys are starting earlier than I, I did. You know, I, I didn't really look into overall finances. I tried to reduce my, uh, you know, my debt coming out of college, but I wasn't debt free. I was close, but, but not debt free. Um, and I had the... Uh, Going to the field we're going to, we start off with what's considered to be relatively high salaries. So I, I knew I would be comfortable, especially at the time I was by myself. Um, but I really learned uh, most of my current financial knowledge just through networking at General Motors. So the, one of the greatest things I ever did 
was the first the first year and a half or so. Um, you know, I started getting my regular salary. I maxed out my 401k. I did pre-tax at first, um, but that that I I can still see the compounding from those initial uh, investments. I did I stopped maxing out as I slowly started. You know, my salary increased over time, and I you know I wanted to have some fun, bought a couple things, but I never really. Um, I always contributed more there than I than the minimum match was for my company. So minimum match should be your absolute baseline. Like never contribute less than that. Otherwise, you're kind of just losing money. Um, but you know, currently, uh, situation is a lot different. So I'm maxing out now. Uh, multiple pre-tax investments, uh, a Roth IRA. There's there's a there's a there's a, there's a, <laughs> a lot of different. Uh, I'll say this: my my portfolio is quite diverse now, um, and now it's rooted in what are my financial goals, and how do I get there. So I think you know. If you can plan that out early, it, it helps because then you can build the steps to get there. Um, for me, it was kind of an, you know, I just adjusted as my, you know, my career adjusted. So, you know, at GM, I think my starting salary was a little bit less than half of what I ended with. So, and that, that's not that's not really um, abnormal. It's something that that's definitely achievable. Um, and then there was. The Silicon Valley leap because it's so much more expensive out here. But uh, what I tried to do is make sure that I wasn't having lifestyle inflation. So right. I don't live much different. I mean, I, I have more space for my family, et cetera. But um, when you get those increases, you want to always try to at least have some sort of equation where you proportionately increase what you're saving. And then diversity is, of course, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. it's very important. And uh, one thing I do, I do that is a little bit unique is I basically don't have cash savings. I have a little bit. I have a small buffer, um, but it's smaller than what most people recommend. And that's because if your portfolio is diverse enough, there are multiple avenues where you can pull funds if you need them. Uh, but I just, to me, I, I keep looking at the time value of money, and I tell myself I, I just can't put it in cash. There's no CD that grows quickly enough. I just feel like it can, right. you know, can be useful elsewhere. That's awesome. That's a great example of how finances are so incredibly customized and personal to who you are. So many people recommend five, ten thousand dollar, you know, cash savings as a buffer, as an emergency savings. Some people uh, have no emergency emergency savings at all in cash because, like you said, they like to have all of their money working for them one way or the other. I know some people just have a credit card as their emergency savings. They'll have a credit card with a ten thousand dollar limit, and they have access to ten thousand dollars if they need it. So. That's awesome. That's a really cool way to hear a little bit of how uh, Phil works. And, you know, we like to get everyone's opinion and everyone's point of view on how they prefer to do their finances, because the best financial advice is what helps you sleep at night. Uh, And that's something I'll I'll go by, you know, for the rest of my life. Right. No, I I couldn't agree more. And it's all good. Oh, Oh, uh, I had one comment. I think I think the. The cash buffer is actually useful if you're just beginning. You don't have you don't have any. Let's say you have no savings. That's when it's actually useful. Um, but over time, you know, if you have a solid buffer and multiple investments, it makes little sense to me at least. Um, it's accessible, and, and you know maybe you may be able to use it in some instances where you'd otherwise not be able to use a credit card or or pull mm-hmm. from a brokerage account. But largely, I, I think. If you look at the numbers, if you extrapolate over time, just keeping that cash in the, the fastest growing CD you can find and just some, some solid investments over time, mm-hmm. it just doesn't make sense to use cash. Right. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, I'm not at that level just yet, but I'm even an individual who doesn't carry cash even, uh, you know, at my at my current level. But no, that's very interesting. And two things I, I, I pulled from, you know, are, are, are that kind of jog my memory. Um, from one of your last statements was that number one, you said lifestyle inflation. So we'll get, that'll be the second point. And to remind me of lifestyle inflation, if I forget, just remind me dog food fan. Maybe you might know what I'm talking about, Phil. We'll get to that dog food fan, Dyson dog food fan. We'll get to that in a second. Right. Uh, right. You know what I'm saying? Right. And then, the, the, yeah, you laugh, yeah. And then, so we'll get to lifestyle inflation in a second. But then the first point that I also heard was that you said, you know, the advantage that maybe Zach, Sean, and I, people like us have is that we're starting this younger, right? So maybe 
if if Phil knew what he knew now, but maybe didn't necessarily necessarily have the money that Phil currently has back when he was our age. What are some what are some things? Because again, our whole audience is basically our age, a little bit older or a little bit younger. What are some things you would you know give some advice to people who are our age? Like, hey, do this, even though you might not have an exuberant amount of money, but how can you set yourself up to be financially free, financially stable, financially fit at our age? What what's some kind of advice for that for those students? Uh, first, number one, I would say minimize debts. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's different for everyone, but if you're coming out of college, you know, it's, it's very tempting. Let's say you get a scholarship or you get a grant. It's really easy to spend that, right? Minimize it as much as possible. Um, second, I would say plan. Plan according to, you know, what your future career is. Make sure you have room for variability. You know, let's say you're really looking at getting this job. You have an idea of what the salaries are, but you don't get it. You know, have, have make sure you understand the plan. Um, second, or third, should I say, is invest as much as you reasonably can at the beginning. The, <clears throat> I'm sure you've seen the charts, but if you look at compound growth from investments, starting, the, the money that you start with is the money that grows the most. And it's very tempting, you know, one of the first things people, people want to do is, oh, you know, I got my job, let me, let me, let me flex a little bit, you know, let me spend a little bit, buy a couple things, have some experiences. I would say try to invest as much as you can. It can be something simple in the beginning, like your company's 401k plan. If it's not a 401k, it can be a Roth IRA, it can be something else. Um, but I would look at spending money that you do choose to spend on experiences rather than possessions. So doing that know, early on. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Okay. And you don't have to do it as, as, a, as a lifestyle, right? You can wait until your career develops, wait until things change, and then you can adjust and say, you know, I can still contribute this much to savings and investments, but also I can start to spend a little bit more on me. Mm -hmm. No, 100%. That's very reminiscent of, again, the book, I Will Teach You Be Rich by Ramit Sethi. Again, that's why I love that book, because it teaches people how to spend, because finance is always about how to save, how to invest, which is all good things but also how to spend wisely, right? So that book has, which I've talked about most of the times on this podcast, is, uh, you know, the idea of money dials and making sure when you do spend, like spending on things that mean something to you, right? So for me, my money dial is, it might be restaurants or it is restaurants. It's, it's, I'm a foodie, but that means something to me. It's an experience. I'm not necessarily just going to blow money on material things and it doesn't either give me a benefit experience wise or it can make me more money, right? So um, no, I completely agree with that. So, okay, I, I, hopefully, a lot of our listeners, uh, you guys took that. So, we'll we'll make sure to reiterate that um, in our in our when we clip this. So, uh, that, that's amazing. And then now, I did remember, right? So, I saw you laugh. So, hopefully, you remember this conversation, right? Because you did mention lifestyle inflation, but it's interesting because when you explain this phenomenon to me, after you told me, I told so many people because you were the first one who like, explained how the way you spend your money is in a way that provides you know, easeability in your life. <clears throat> so when I said Dyson dog food fan, Zach's like, huh? Listeners are like, what? I remember Phil told me, he was like, Inga, you're going to be mad at me or you're going to be outrageous when you, when you hear this. He was like, Inga, I, and I, trust me, I kind of saw this when I went to go visit him. He has multiple Dyson fans, the little like round hollow ones, right? Super cool. He was like, Inga, I bought a Dyson fan strictly to blow the smell of the dog food in my house through like out the window if that's its only purpose and i'm sitting here like first off dyson fans are x amount of dollars you know but i'm like you bought it for this but then when he explained it to me it's like well i don't want my house to be smelling and i don't want to you know do xyz as well as he's told me as well i think you might have mentioned you have like the actual dyson vacuums on like each level or a couple level of levels of your floor you know it's like i would rather spend that money to kind of get back my time than to travel up and down my my house and you know vacuum or you know try to do all these things manipulate the dog food and you when you explain that to me i was like wow okay and you also said you're like inka you're at a stage right now where you might not fully grasp it when you make that kind of money you'll make those kinds of decisions where you value time over the money which i'm starting to see a little bit more but when i heard that i was like whoa nonetheless can you kind of explain that in more depth and even maybe some more examples maybe outrageous maybe not as outrageous, but what are some, you know, what are some examples that can you explain, you know, the reasoning for, you know, now that you value 
time over money? Maybe it's because you have more money or it's because you just, you view it differently. Like how can you kind of explain that a little bit? Yes, it's, I'm really glad you asked this because I was going to try to bring it up anyway, but the, uh, the dog food Dyson example is probably the most extreme. That, that one I, is difficult to justify, but let me give you another example. <laughs> Let's say I have a project that I'm going to do on my car. If I was a single guy, I would just do it. But I have a wife and a son now. So my time is very like, I'm going to go home, do a couple things. My son, maybe eat dinner. He's going to go to bed. And it's, I don't have that much free time after that. <laughs> and I'm going to sleep as well. So instead of, you know, trying to push around my schedule to allocate time to this task, I can just pay someone to do it. But the, the value of your time, you have to look at it at, on a, an income basis. So if I look at, um, you know, what I currently bring home and what it costs to do the task, sometimes the time that I save from just paying for it is much more valuable than the money. So it's really, the cost basis depends on you, how you value your time and how, you know, how things are budgeted. So you'll see, you'll see that you'll, I think anyone you talk to that's, you know, at least similar to me or, or maybe higher level, they'll, it's all about maximizing time. Time is, time, think of time as the most valuable resource. It's infinite in its cost. So anyway, you can say that once you get to a certain point where everything is comfortable, you have a plan for retirement, all the excess money is about just enjoying the time. That's really what the ultimate goal is. If you took money out of the equation and no one made any money and everyone just worked just you know to appease themselves everyone would want to do things that they enjoy and maximize time so that those become like two fun foundational goals um <clears throat> so yeah the dog food fan one that 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 one is uh <laughs> i think it's worth it still but uh, right. i also yeah. never buy i buy very few things at retail the only thing i think i buy at retail is like a new iphone that's my only option, <laughs> you know, mm. but those fans I got, um, right. I think that one was 30% of MSRP. Okay. So I'm still like weirdly frugal when I don't have to be, I just, whatever your income level is, let's say I'm Jeff Bezos and I want to buy a yacht for $500 million, but I can get it for 250. I think I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do what I can to get the 250. So I still have that, that same kind of mindset. Um, right. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I find that very interesting because I think, you know, from the people I've either were raised with my family or even friends, the idea of, you know, either buying food all the time every single evening and not, you know, cooking. It, it's, it's an interesting balance because I think for a lot of people, they understand, we understand that cooking is a good skill. But like you mentioned, when you reach a certain threshold of, let's say, you know, monetary um, affluence or you have, you know, a uh, good capital on you, when you realize that, I, to make this food, which might take two hours, cumulatively, I w in those two days, two hours, I can make X amount of dollars. It would be to my disadvantage to spend those two hours. If it's not like a date night and it's not for like an event, it would be at my disadvantage to cook that food for two hours than to just order it. And while that's, you know, they're taking care of that, yes, I have to pay a premium to have it sent over to me, but I'm effectively saving money because I saved my time from actually cooking it. It's a very interesting phenomenon that, again, you introduced me to. But I'm like, I, I can't see it the same. And I, and I agree. Uh, I'm doing even things at my level where I'm, you know, putting more money into getting time back for me or freeing up time for me. So I completely love that when you kind of told me that. But nonetheless, I, I, that's so funny that uh, you remember that I remember that and we talked about that. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, Wait, Yenka, I have, I have a point yeah, here. I want to ask you something. So are you, when you do this, are you, are you, actually make like are you crunching the numbers here and you're making more money than you're spending and therefore making a profit or are you simply valuing your time more than the money you spend to, to buy the food that's a good question i think for me at my stage i'm not necessarily calculating and being like oh if i did like i just mentioned with the food analogy mm -hmm. i'm not necessarily doing that at the moment but i'm like for me whatever the task is or whatever i could be doing mm -hmm. i would rather you know, spend a, that premium on whatever the activity is to have it be done or have it be made or, you know, or even just not do it because the time that I put into it, I could be doing other things to get more things done. So I'm not necessarily making the money just yet or calculating in terms of money, but like, what can I be doing to get more important things done mm -hmm. in that same amount of time? Gotcha. You know, so 
but I can definitely see my, you know, my, my paradigm kind of shift when it comes to, you know, the monetary side of it. But yeah, it's, it's a very interesting conversation. I remember when we talked about it, I was just like so blown away, but then I thought about it for a while. I was like, wait, hold on. That makes sense. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think, you know, the, the next thing I would love to talk about, Phil, is, you know, what are not only maybe can you talk about briefly, you know, how you're enjoying your job and, you know, maybe what Apple's like, obviously working at the biggest company in the world, you know, maybe the culture there, what that's like, but even like what's Phil's future plans? Because I remember you telling me, you know, you're big into, you know, music or even like sound quality, which is super sick. Uh, it's an awesome niche that you're into, you know, whether that's, um, you know, building your own business for yourself or venturing off into more of your passions once you're financially at the place that you're at. Or maybe it is retiring at Apple, whatever that means to you, right? So not only what your current situation, how you're enjoying Apple is, but then also to what's what's kind of the future for Phil. Ah, great question. So uh, I'll speak about my my time at Apple. Um, it's been incredible thus far. I mean, the the project that I'm working on is, at least for me, it's absolutely invigorating, and that's that's about all you can ask for. It's it's a combination of pace and challenge that is difficult to find elsewhere. So. Just to give you some background, like I'll give you an abstract example here. At GM, there were so many layers of management that uh, it would be, it was very structured. It's difficult to just go do something, right? There's lots of red tape that you have to get through, approvals from multiple levels, et cetera. The team here is so lean. If I want to do something, I just go do it. I've documented and maybe have a few meetings to explain myself, but you just go do it. The pace is extremely quick. So like today, I mean, from the minute I walked in the building till now, it's been super fast paced. But I, what I realized is that not only do you feel more productive, but your days feel quicker. Right? You have to fill that time up with, with things to do. Um, sometimes there's pressure, you know, most of the time there's not, but uh, it, it's been an absolute, absolutely wonderful experience. Um, the culture is different. Um, people come to work dressed however they want really. There's a senior director I know that wears flip flops into the office. So, um, and right now we are, <clears throat> it's weird because my job function does require me to be here, but the entire company for the most part is working three days a week, but I have Mondays and Fridays off, which it's really nice for us because we, like pre pandemic, for what I do, I'd have to be in the office anyway. So I think of it from that perspective when I get to work from home Monday and Friday. I could go to Hawaii on Thursday night and return on Monday if I wanted to. Haven't tried it yet, but that's on the that's the plan. I'm going to try that. So, um, yeah, no, Apple is a uh, it's been great so far. Um, and then, you know, when, when you make a leap like that, it's it's a giant unknown, right? Will I be good enough? You know, how will I fit in? How will I fit in culturally? Are there people that I can relate to here? Um, you know, what's the, the overall? culture of the company because companies are like individuals themselves like everyone has a different personality and you'll see that if you ever have the opportunity to go to different places each company is distinct for the most part so um yeah uh, apple is it it is a dream um now for the future um i'll stay here and i'll probably stay on this project until i get bored as long as i'm invigorated i'm not going anywhere <laughs> Uh, if that does change, or, or maybe I get to the point where I can comfortably retire sooner than I think I can, at that point, I'll probably just start my own thing. Like you said, pursuing my passions, find a way to monetize it and start my own business. That's like the next stage um, after. But being here right now and uh, remaining here is what will fund that in the future. I see. Yeah, no, that's, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I'm, I'm glad you're liking it. Again, that's why we were talking. Like, I want in kind of experience that as well. I think that'd be awesome. But it's 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 really amazing that you're able to you know wake up, be challenged by going to a job that you enjoy, but also again stimulate your mind and you feel comfortable with it. And I think that's you know any person's dream job, right? Which is beautiful. Um, yeah, no, you know one thing that kind of actually popped in my mind is it's not necessarily a tangent, but it's kind of like a pivot. What I mean by this, what popped in my mind when we, again, we were talking about Apple. I remember when we were first talking, you were telling me about this really cool app. I think it's called Blind, right? And, you know, perhaps you can talk about that, perhaps not, that's up to you. But kind of the question actually stems from that is, you know, being a very, not only working for a tech company, but being very much, you know, technologically oriented as yourself. Because I know you have your whole home tricked out with, uh, you know, HomeKit, which is sick. But nonetheless, you know, what are some, uh maybe like low-key hidden gems because like, then that's what popped my mind like blind 
uh, whether they're like apps or maybe their websites. Like I know you mentioned, maybe perhaps you have some websites out there. You're able to get things, you know, at discount MSRP, but like, what are some tips, tricks, plugs, kind of low key things since you're a big technology guy um, that you would recommend for people who are trying to, you know, get really good with their tech? Ooh, that, that's a, that's a tough one. Um, but I'll, okay. I'll state this, um, because tech is, it's gotten to the point where it's very consumer friendly, right? In the early days, you had to be somewhat of a nerd. I, I, I admit to being this, um, this is like, you know, <laughs> mid nineties, right? So like right. getting on the internet is through a dial up modem, that kind of thing. Um, but now, uh, I, I think you have to set two things. I, I do this like across the board. What is your goal? So forget about wanting to be a techie for the sake of being a techie. Like if I want my house to be a smart home, what is my goal? What do I want to do? Just imagine it, right? Set that, and then you also set a budget. Then you can find a solution within those constraints. So for me, it's like, I want to control every light or I want to do this, I want to do that. And then I have a, a budget, which I don't, my budget wasn't unlimited, but you know, it was, I think it was a reasonable number. And I was able to achieve that by using HomeKit. Um, but I would say for like smart home stuff, just find an ecosystem and stick with it. Uh, Apple is never or rarely first. They, they pick what they want to be first to. Everything else is a refinement. And uh, once I stuck to one ecosystem, I realized that, let's say, I don't know, Google comes out with something really cool like Night Shift. I was, I was, a, little bit, I was a little bit jealous, but I knew that it would just be a matter of time before Apple comes out with something uh, that performs similarly or outperforms it. So I just stick with one ecosystem and I honestly don't have time to to, to tinker and tweak like I used to. So it, it makes life a little bit easier, a little bit smoother. Right. Uh, so that's that's part one. Um, another hack, let's see. Oh, um, Blind, brilliant. So I, I discovered Blind, uh, this started when I was at General Motors, but I was interviewing here and I was like, whoa, how do I live in the Bay Area? Like, what should I expect? Because, you know, these things aren't publicly advertised, but actually there was a change that's just made in California law where uh, these tech companies have to post their salary ranges. I think I saw that, yeah. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it tells you very little, right? A senior director here probably has a base salary that isn't that much more than mine, maybe 30%. You'd expect it to be multiples, right? But all the other- The columns. stock grants, yep. The stock grants are what the difference is and they don't have to disclose that. So the salary ranges are kind of just a, I don't know, if you think about the worst day Wall Street could ever have, your base salary is what you have to live off of. But I can tell you now that most of my compensation is not my base salary. So it's a little, a little kind of, it's a little deceiving, right? So Blind is an app where you can kind of, it's, it's essentially anonymous workplace talk. So uh, you sign up for Blind, you do it via your work email. That's how they can verify that you're an actual employee. And you can have conversations with other employees about salary ranges, what's your offer like, you know, how's it in Google, what's the comp like at the startup. And so it gives you much better insight um, in what to expect. So for me, I did like these rudimentary calculations. This is how much it costs the Bay Area versus Detroit. And I said, okay, I need to make this much. Um, so I, I gave myself a number and if my offer was lower than that, I was going to go. And if it was more, I'd obviously try to maximize that, but I was going. So <laughs> right. that's how I did it. But blind was extremely useful because I had no idea what the numbers were like. Um, and in hindsight, I well, my initial offer was uh, was competitive. So I was happy. Gotcha. No, that's huge. Yeah, I know that's definitely what I'm going to be tapping into when I get my full-time position. Blind, shout out to Blind. Um, I remember when you first told me about it, I looked up, look, looked this up. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely using that when I get full-time. So this is this is a huge plug, but like you said, it's not publicly advertised. Oh, wow. Yeah, go ahead. One quick thing. Yeah. I just want to say for, for everyone out there who's going into the workforce, you, you can even do this at the co-op level, but I don't think it's really useful. But when you go full time, do not fear negotiating. Never fear negotiating. Always negotiate mm. if you can. You don't have to you don't have to be pushy about it, but just ask. Um, but there are strategies and techniques to doing that. Um, especially if you have background knowledge on what like the comp ranges are, you can say, well, my offer is this, but I would like this. Can you meet mm -hmm. that? You can be nice about it, but um, that wow. that starts you off Pretty higher. 
uh, from the beginning and it, it, it follows you, you know, as your as your compensation grows. Great tip. Yeah. Do your research and you will be compensated with it. You know, again, the worst answer you can get is a no, because if you got the offer, they're not just going to take the offer from you because you asked. That's not what they're going to do. Right. So don't like like Phil said, don't be afraid to just ask. Make sure you do your research, because the more research you'll do, the more opportune a yes will you know, kind of come out. So that, that's huge. Uh, great tip there. Um, one kind of maybe last general topic I'll pivot into <clears throat> will be like, you know, you know, Phil, very knowledgeable in, you know, finances and kind of setting up all these perfect, you know, ways to streamline his finances and, you know, other, um, kind of systems and processes in place to kind of not only set himself up for the future, but maybe your family. Right. And I had the pleasure of meeting your wonderful family almost a year ago, which is crazy to think about. Um, but yeah, you know, what are some things that you're doing? Maybe it's certain types of accounts. Maybe it's even just like relaying the information to your, you know, your son or even to your wife. And maybe she's already self-knowledgeable in that. Um, maybe it's like reading certain types of books to him. Cause I know there's even like financial literacy books for kids now, right? What have you, what is Phil doing to kind of make sure that his family is going to be financially literate for the rest of their lives. And also the, the generation uh, that comes after you, you know, uh, what is the kind of the steel family? What, what are they kind of getting themselves into in terms of what Phil's putting into them? Uh, this is another great question. So uh, just to give you some history, um, my my father was a factory worker, a good year tire member, uh, but he did something that was critically important to uh, setting me up for really good credit. So he added me and my sisters to one of his old Sears credit cards. So my my oldest credit line is 41 years. Uh, I'm not 41 years old, so. <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, yes. Uh, and what, what the, uh, the, the rules of banking are a little bit different now, so it's more difficult. But there are a couple of credit cards where you can add your child as an authorized user so that they inherit your credit history. So my son has his own credit card. It's a, it's a Chase card. I have it sitting in a, <laughs> it's sitting in a, a closet somewhere, but can't touch it, but it's, he's building credit technically, even though he has no income. So that's, that's part one. Um, it, it, credit is so critically important as well. So let's say you don't have credit, start building it as early as possible. You can start with a secured credit card, just the simple things. Um, and if your credit, if you do have credit and it's not great, try to get that, you know, credit is just basically the ability to borrow, right? So the better your credit is, the more you can borrow cheaply. But um, I, I think, and I'm sure you guys have talked about this a lot about how credit works, um, but it, it's just, it's so important. I mean, for, for anything, um, even if you have all the cash in the world, you cannot obtain certain things without credit. So just want to emphasize that. Uh, the other thing I did was I put, uh, I started a 529 for my son for his education. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a myth out there that, um, but let, let's say we set a target. Let's say when he's, right now he's three. Say when he's 18, we need 200,000 for, for school. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like a lot, but building it up over time, it really isn't a lot and it's tax advantaged. So, <clears throat> you know, right. the money that, that comes out lowers your taxable income and you can tax less. So I love pre-tax investments. <laughs> um, so, but it, in the event that he gets a full ride or he doesn't want to go to school, you can repurpose that money. Some people think it's tied to an institution, but that's not the case. So it becomes another investment if your child doesn't use it. So mm -hmm. 529 for him. And at the moment, um, just fundamentally, I'm just teaching him things. So I, I'm the guy, I'm the one who always shows him how things work. I'll like literally sit down like, we see this, this is why this does this. And we're building that foundation. Um, apparently he is fairly, uh, fairly well off in terms of his intellectual ability. And, you know, I, I didn't really care. I just wanted him to be healthy, but he's doing right. very well. So very happy about that. And uh, mom does the creative fun stuff. But for me, I'm always trying to show him how and why. That's awesome. Uh, so that that's for 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 me and, and Maver Maverick is my son, by the way, um, and my wife. We're we're starting to combine things, so we do have one joint account, which is on our Apple Card, actually. So oh, okay, that's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So that's how I uh, I love the cash bag. I just I just love how it tracks everything. It's just so yeah. easy to see. And then the cash bag, I'm just like, look at my daily cash. So uh, I, I wanted to have that experience as well. And that's okay. the only thing that we have that's joint. Um, everything else is. The rest is just an optimization, right? So um, 
I do my taxes manually, so I always try to optimize for our combined income. So we're married, so we file jointly. It's a big tax advantage. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a rough to give you a rough, a rough estimate of the delta. If I did not, uh, you know, file jointly with my wife, I would owe about thirty five thousand more in tax. Mm -hmm. So it's <laughs> it's a massive difference. Yeah, hundred percent. No, well, that's that's huge. Um, you just gave me a, a smooth idea that what I'm going to do with my future children, you know, make sure they get a credit card before they can even speak. Hundred percent. Now that's huge. Um, yeah. Phil, you know, this episode has been fire. Just gems after gems after gems. I know I've even had some more personal questions. We'll talk to you know when we have our mentor mentee meeting. But um, again, we want to appreciate you, and we have kind of, I, I guess I do I have kind of, you know, three last questions, just small kind of fire round questions, right? So. You know, kind of the first question is in terms of, you know, books and maybe financial books per se, what is one financial book that you would like recommend to anyone? Like you must read this. If you're trying to get in finance, this is the book you must read. Oh, that is, that is tough. Yeah, there's so many. Um, yeah, no, it's actually, uh, I don't know if this book is popular though. So this, I don't, I don't think I told you the story, but I have a neighbor. Um, he lived next to us in the complex that she visited, and he his company has a book that's all about early financial literacy, and oh, it wow. starts from the basics. And uh, I have to check and see if it's available. Um, yeah, you should send me that if you, me if you find the point. information. Yeah. He, he gave me a copy and I was like, oh, this is wonderful. Like the first half of the book I basically knew, but that's because you know I have experience, but it, it starts from the beginning and just gives a bunch of strategies on how to build wealth. I think it was called building wealth, just sim as simple as that, but it's not for, it's not for a specific demographic, it's for everyone. So if you have nothing, you can start here right. and begin to build. Um, uh, just like very, it started from, you know, just having the charts of, if you start building wealth by investing right. 10 years earlier, this is how much more you have to contribute 10 years later. Just mm -hmm. simple things like that. Um, so yeah, my, my neighbor actually had a hand in writing that book. So. Oh, okay. Um, that, that's one, <laughs> yeah. Um, Real quick, what's, so what's the author of that, if that book, if people want to look it up? Um, he's not the author. So I, I, okay. I, I wish I had it on me because I don't have the information in my head. I know where it is, I'll get back to you though. Okay, yeah, you can um, send it to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. fine. I have to send you that book. Okay. Gotcha. Um, the, the, a lot of the other information that I learned, though, was by proxy and networking. So the, the initial group of friends that I was with at General Motors, okay. I think they're just their family, family history. They had so much more knowledge than I had. So I started kind of doing things by proxy because they would explain some things. It made a lot of sense. Um, I, I'll try to be quick here with this. There's one story I have where... When I came out of college, I immediately rented an apartment. Okay. Wasn't ready to buy for various reasons, but I did only rent for three years. So that was nice. Um, so if you can get your hands on some property at the right time in the right location, always go for that, especially especially in the Midwest. West Coast is a little bit different, but um, <laughs> but a couple of my friends, uh, <laughs> one, one guy bought a house and three of them lived together. So four of them lived together. And while... Everyone saved on rent. They were just you know, saving the property, and he had equity in the house. It was a brilliant solution that uh, I, at the time I didn't understand how much they were actually saving. But it's just a way to get a head start. Um, and not everyone's comfortable with that. You know, some people want to be completely independent. But honestly, we were basically glorified college kids, so they basically had buddies. You know, and the house was was large enough for him and himself. And I think it was maybe two or three years later, all of those guys that were roommates bought homes. And the one who owned the home, he just, you know, ended up having a family in that house. So it's a quick way to kind of expedite the, the property, the owning property process. Wow. Yeah, that's smart. Holy. I think, yeah, if, maybe that might have been a form of house hacking. But nonetheless, clearly it worked out for them. That's a sick idea. Um, yeah. Cool. No, thank you for that. And again, I'm looking forward to when you send me that book. I really want to tap into that. Um, but then also as well, you know, the next question is, what is, you know, what we are in October. So like two less than like three months left um, of the year. So what, what is what is one of Phil's kind of main goals to make sure, and maybe I can also keep you accountable because obviously we text often too. What is one goal that Phil's really trying to execute by the end of 2022? Or maybe you've already executed all of them. 
whatever have you, what is one goal you're really trying to implement in 2023? However you want to answer that, we're talking about goals for this question. Ah, so, um, so it's weird times. October is like compensation month at Apple. So you get your okay. performance review, you get your comp changes. So I, like, I would say almost up to this point, kind of like, it's kind of dangling over your head. Like what, what is your, how are you perceived, you know? And once that, once that passes, it's kind of a relief. I feel like I can focus on other things. So mm -hmm. um, there's, I have two goals in mind. Uh, one is fitness related. Um, okay. Because I, I got to the point where I was so busy that it was difficult to weave time in for, you know, just keeping myself healthy. But health and, and life are critical. They kind of have a relationship you can't really break. The healthier right. you are, I think you're just ex you'll be able to do the tasks you need to do day to day better. Yeah, that's yeah. as simple as I can put it. So uh, now that, you know, this milestone is over, I have two focuses. One is to, um, I, I want to get an exceeds rating in every category, every metric that they measure. So I'm like really driving towards that. I think I know exactly how to do it. I'm gonna just focus on that from a work perspective. Um, outside of that, I'm just trying, I have, I have goals to target how I wanna get into a certain type of physical condition. So I'm going to really push forward on that because I, I think I can, uh, I don't wanna say go on autopilot, but uh, I can allocate resources in terms of time and effort to focus on getting in better physical shape. Mm. Yeah, no, that's simple. I remember we've two primary goals. Yeah. yeah, no, and I remember we've talked about both of them too. I think that's sick. Um, wanting to excel at work and you know have that metric to be like, yeah, I did that, um, which is sick. But then also as well, you know, kind of that that health and fitness kind of goal, which we talk about all the time. You know, literally in the new age, health is wealth because you can have all the money in the world, but if you're not healthy enough to enjoy it, it means nothing. Um, so yeah, and I know you know other we can have talk talk about that on the side. But I love to tell people, you know, what gets measured gets managed. So whether it's your time and a calendar, money and a budget, even your fitness, it can be on an app. It could be, you know, written down in a notebook. For our listeners out there, even for Phil too, like the best way to really get on a workout regimen is just just know where you are, know where you're at, your weight, maybe like the diameter of your thighs, your 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 bust, your your you know your your neck, whatever, and just stay consistent with it. And then you kind of measure, hey, you know what? Maybe I hit 135 on the bench this week. I'm gonna do 140. I'm gonna have two and a half pounds on each side and just stick to that. And you met you use that metrics, which is in, you know, however you um you measure that in your app or in your in your book and just stay consistent with it. Stay consistent. And that's what's helped me. That's why I've been doing it for over, you know, a year now. And it's very significantly helped me. So that's beautiful. I know we'll we'll continue to talk about that on the side. But then the last question I have you, which is the lightest question out of all of them. Is for our listeners who just absolutely enjoyed our podcast um, with an amazing guest, where can they find you? Whether it's social media or wherever, where can our listeners find you? So the, the best place to find me is LinkedIn. Um, but also, I want to actually tie this back to the beginning of the podcast. Um, this is really okay. about how we met. Yeah. Um, no one ever reaches out. I think, uh, I think even Steve Jobs mentioned this. Like one thing he would do is just reach out to people. Like it's almost like people have this innate fear. Um, so I, I can tell you that in every now and then I'll get some alumni that like wants me to refer them to a role. And I don't mind. I'm a nice guy generally. But I think um, most people will help you if you ask. It's it's not it's it's not uh, you know it's not like annoying or anything. It's really an honor to be asked. To assist. So when you when you came to me, I was like, oh, it's interesting, you know. And I just didn't mind at all. So um, to everyone out there, don't be afraid to ask anyone who's anywhere close to where you want to be or on the path that you want to follow. Just try to get advice from them. It, uh, all it will do is expedite you and stop you from making mistakes that they made. So um, I just want to say, yeah, feel free to reach out. Um, but yeah, you can reach me on LinkedIn. Honestly, you could give people my phone number. I mean, if they it doesn't matter to me <laughs> okay if it gets too yeah. crazy i can i can i can press the black button so okay. uh, i don't have other social media uh, that, that was a decision i used to kind of streamline my time but yeah, mm -hmm. currently it's only LinkedIn. okay yeah and again i can attest to this phil is an amazing individual for all of our listeners if you want to reach out to him feel free um ask him any questions but I, again, I'm super thankful for you, Phil. I'm thankful that, you know, you even made some time uh, out of your work day to come talk to us and give us, just drop gems. This, these are gems and we appreciate that. Um, but yes, to kind of wrap up, uh, Zach, do you have any other questions or if not, 
where can our listeners find you? Uh, just like Phil, everyone can find me on LinkedIn uh, at ZLN22. You'll see my headshot there, uh, smiling nice and bright when you uh, look at my name or that tagline. Um, yeah, I uh, really appreciate everyone taking the time to listen tonight, especially if you got this far. Um, thanks so much. Yeah, again, we appreciate you all. I'm Ole Inkafamadu. You can find me at LinkedIn on Ole Inkafamadu, at Ole Inkafamadu. And again, we want to appreciate you. We want to appreciate you, Phil, as well. And uh, yeah, this was On The Fly Podcast.